Good morning, y'all. I hope y'all had a great couple of weeks. I'm so happy to be back with you guys. Happy Palm Sunday. Um, I want to read a quick scripture um, in honor of Palm Sunday. John 12, 13 says, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Um, so Palm Sunday is in honor of when Jesus rode on the back of a donkey into um, the city and people were praising and shouting his name, Hosanna, uh, in the highest. And yeah, it's just, it's so awesome to me that Jesus not only came in the form of a baby, which is like the lowest of the low, and like was born in a manger, but he also rode as the king of the Jews, as the king of, well, all of us, like into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Like who does that? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus does that. Um, but yeah, so I just want to open us in prayer before we enter into worship. Um, Jesus, I just thank you um, that you humbled yourself to come and save us all. Um, it's a burden that you didn't have to bear, but you did. You thought of each of us when you did that as well. Um, you knew the life you were going to have to live. You knew that you were going to have to face death, but still you did it, even though you didn't want to. Um, so... I thank you for that from the bottom of my heart, and I just thank you for all these people that you have brought here today. I pray that you touch us all through this service today, and have your way, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen.
morning, everybody. Please go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to One Life, those of you that are here in the room and those of you that are online. We are so blessed to have you be a part of our family. 
with that, those of you who are in-house, please make sure if we've not met you before that you fill out a connection card. And for everyone, please remember that we want to pray for you for whatever storm you might be walking through. So fill out the prayer requests and put them in the um, basket as we pass them around later. Just a few quick announcements. We will be uh, wrapping up The Chosen on um, Tuesday night, watching the last of season three. Season four will not be streaming for a while, but don't worry, in the future we will bring it together. When that, once we finish The Chosen, we're gonna be breaking into our men's, women's, and teen life groups. So be on the lookout for information about that. We're very excited next week to have Paul, Pastor Paul with us, um, to have a live speaker. Um, he's gonna be with us Easter Sunday, and he's also gonna be with us the next week and doing our baptism service. See one of us if you're interested in getting baptized because we would love to walk that journey with you. And uh, we are excited just for all that God is doing in and through this church. And we're so thankful for everyone that is here. In just a moment, we're gonna go ahead and pass around the offering. Um, thank you to those who are able to give not only of um, your tithes, but any talents and service that you want to give to the church. We do have a sign-up sheet back there if you're interested in exploring more of ways that you can give of your talent and your time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, when we look at and think about that rugged cross that is there, that even though we weren't there 2,000 years ago, we are the reason that you were nailed to the cross. And you did it for us and for each one of us. So as we are going in from Palm Sunday today through Good Friday, Lord, I pray that we will all spend time resting in what you did for each one of us during this Holy Week. And through it, Lord, we might come to know you even more in a special way. We are so thankful that we can put our trust in you and who you are. And it's in your name we pray, amen. When you're done with your tithe and offering, you can uh, stand back up and worship with me. Um, in honor of this season of just celebrating Jesus and what he's done for us, let us not take it lightly. Like he bore the cross that we were meant to bear and he is so worthy of our praise, so. We could all just fix our eyes on him this morning as we sing this song and just remember the thing that he has saved you from and lay down anything that's blocking you from having a good relationship with him. I know there's things in my life as well. We all have things that we should lay down before Jesus. And if we say that we don't, that's just pride talking because um, we're all sinful and we're never gonna be perfect. So, So let's just lock eyes with Jesus here.
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, uh, I just want to take a second to just praise you. You did not have to give yourself on the cross for us. In fact, you asked your father to take that from you. But still, you said your will be done. You did that for our pain, for our grief, and for our suffering, for our sin. In that one moment on the cross, Jesus, you bore everything, past, present, and future sins, was nailed to the cross in your hands and in your feet. You took the nails of our suffering, our sin, our grief. Sometimes I ask, like, why, Jesus? Why would you do that? You're just, you're so good. You can't, like, comprehend how good you are, Jesus. But you did that for each of us. You had each of our names on your mind when you sat there and took those nails, when you took the lashes. We just thank you for doing the thing that none of us would be able to do. Greater love is um, none than that would, uh, sorry, uh, lay one's life down for his friends. And um, Jesus, you are love. That is your definition is love. Um, we thank you just for loving us, for who we are, for grabbing us from whatever pit we were in and changing us. And Jesus, I pray if anyone under the sound of my voice hasn't yet made you their love, made you um, the Lord of their life, I pray that today that you would just show them how much that you love them. That the God of the universe died for you. He bore your suffering, he bore your sin. And for those of us that know him and that are going through a valley right now, I pray that you let us know that you are with us. Even in the dry seasons, even in the valleys, the lowest of lows, you are there, Jesus. You see us and you weep with us. Often we think that you're some distant father that doesn't recognize when we're hurting, but you know that's part of what you bore on the cross. I thank you for that, Jesus. I pray that um, Pastor Pete's message would be anointed and that our ears would hear it and receive it well um, and that we could just worship you with all of our being because that is what you deserve. You deserve no less. In fact, you deserve more, but you are receptive to our praise because that's all you ask for us, for us to glorify you, Jesus. Um, so I just ask that you draw each of us near to you in deeper relationship with you. Um, yeah, in your name I pray. Well, good morning. I'm so glad to see y'all. I hope you're reading the words of that walk-up video. They're intentional, and they're meant to remind us that every single one of us in the room fits into one, if not many of those categories, and here's one we all fit into. There's not a single one of us who's here by accident. You're not on earth by accident. You're not in Henderson, Kentucky by accident. You're not in One Life Henderson Church by accident. We are here on purpose. I've been praying all week that with this rather tender topic, 
that God would prepare our hearts so that we would all be recipients and step into the purpose for which he has you here. I want everything God has for me, and I want you to have everything God has for you. So thanks for stepping into a room that is beyond capacity, but thanks for squishing in and making space. And who knows, we'll be making some more room soon. But in the meantime, doesn't this feel kind of good to have people all with you worshiping hard? Listen, I'll tell you, it's a beautiful thing of God. Jackie and I have been in this state, uh, in this beautiful church, in this great city for just over six months. And it feels way longer because, I no, hold on, it's getting good. I'm not saying it feels like we've been around. It just seems like a lot's happened, doesn't it? Like a lot has happened for just six months. So we're really thrilled and honored. But I was reflecting, given our topic for the day, I was reflecting on when we first were interviewing here. It was in the summertime. And we were interviewing, and we got off the plane in Evansville, and Bob Seymour, our highly esteemed bass player you see seated on that throne very often, um, he picked us up, he brought us across the bridge, and he took us on a tour. We would receive three tours by the time that first weekend was over, and we saw lots of beautiful, great things. We saw the bridge, we saw the water, we saw the river walk, we saw Second Street, we saw Hometown Roots, and we saw Central Park, okay? That's what I remember most because all the tours took us to those places amongst other places. Um, and that was just, I don't know, it was just really great and beautiful. But I got to confess, something I've never said before now, around every turn of those tours, as we would go from street to street and turn to turn, I kept waiting to see my favorite fast food restaurant show up. I kept waiting to turn a corner, and there it would be uh, glistening like a beacon in the night, and I would see my favorite place. And I don't want to tell you what it is as much as just tell you it's got a very uh, cow-friendly menu, okay? And, and I just expected, I just expected to see it, okay? Um, and, and I didn't. And by the way, if any of y'all, of you are sitting here going, okay, I've heard it from a few people. So obviously I was talking about the Chick-fil-A. And if any of else of you wants to start one and you know who to get us in with, I'll be a partner right now. I will act, I'm carrying money on me right now to help this happen in case this sparked any ideas. But I kept thinking we'd see a Chick-fil-A and we did not. And I would love one much closer by. Somebody said, hey, what's the big deal? 30 minutes away, I'm going, what's the big deal? It's Chick-fil-A. So, 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 so I was thinking about this. Where we came from, right for here in South Carolina, we had a Chick-fil-A about a mile and a quarter, mile and a half from our church. And the way ministry works is you kind of go with the flow. It's not a nine-to-five deal. Crises happen, surprises happen, spontaneity happens, stuff, life happens because it's with people. So, you know, a lot of times you're here throughout and you miss meals and you just run by and grab something, and we would all the time. And I'd cruise out and right down the road. And as I cruised to get a quick little bite, Something happened almost every single time that I still remember to this day. I'd come around the corner, church here, come around, come around the corner, come around the side road, and on my left, first I would see Chick-fil-A. And man, that was like, there's a good feeling. Chick-fil-A, that's right, it's not Sunday, all right, come on. And, and like, I, then what you would immediately notice is this. There would be a line of cars that were at the drive through that went all the way around the building, then back down the side, then to the entrance, down the entrance, down the little street, and into traffic. And that was the line to Chick-fil-A. And by the way, it was a double drive through So that was two lines of cars with that deal. And you're just going, oh my goodness, I'm in a hurry. That's a big, long wait. Well, something else would happen. Right next to Chick-fil-A was McDonald's. And right after you saw Chick-fil-A and saw that line, you'd see McDonald's. And to look at McDonald's, it had the appearance of being actually closed. Like, like there were no cars. And I don't mean every now and then. I mean line, 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 line down the road, actually closed. That's what it looked like, but it was wide open. I mean, it was completely open for business. Nobody was visiting the Golden Arches. And I'm just going, oh, no. Now, here's the deal. Even though I drove up and I saw this huge line, knew there was a huge wait, here's what I knew. I knew that there was zero doubt which place I was going. Even though I was in a hurry, even though I could just pull right up to the McDonald's, I knew that I was going to Chick-fil-A. Why did I know that without any doubt? Because I knew that the Chick-fil-A uh, chicken sandwich minus a pickle on the side and the waffle fries, I knew that that would be way better than the Big Mac that was awaiting me that I could get right away. I knew this was quicker, but I knew this was better. And I was thinking about that related to the series that we're in. You know. It's called Hope Is Rising. This series is not called Hope Is Rising. It's called Hope Is 
rising. It's a reminder that the news doesn't have it right and the trend lines don't have it right. We are watching God do special things in our church and in our city and in our region. And hope is on the rise, I promise. If you don't feel that yet, you will in time. Now having said that, I, I just knew, thinking about the importance of this series and the topic at hand, I was thinking to myself, you know when hope is the hardest? Hope is the hardest when you have to wait. Hope is the hardest when there's enduring to be done, when there's patience, when there's trusting that has to happen, when it doesn't just come quickly, when the thing you want doesn't show any signs of showing up, when the thing you want doesn't show any sign of showing up, to maintain a hope on the rise, that's when it's hardest. And in fact, that's most of the time what we have to experience. I remember when I first came to Christ, I probably was a Christian for six months. Either the first or second verse I ever memorized. Uh, I was taught it at this leadership conference, and they said, here's how to memorize. We memorized, memorized the definition of faith. Faith out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It simply says this. For those of you taking notes, this is a great definition. And this is the NIV 84. It's an old translation, but it's terrific. And it simply says this. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for in Christ and certain of that which is still unseen or that which is invisible or that which is difficult to picture because it's not showing up. And as I memorized that verse, you know that sometimes through this series we've been talking about David. Now, not so much because David's in our Easter series all that much, but because David gives us a journal through the Psalms. He shares all the challenges and the ups and downs of his life and how often he's in a position of difficulty, yet how he's bringing it around to hope in God all the time. So I think it would do you well if you find yourself in a tough spot. Read through the Psalms. Start at Psalm 1. Make your way through. It's a great place. You can read one a day. You can read one in the half in the morning, half at night, two, one in the morning, one at night. Read through David's journal a little bit. But in Psalm 62, there's this beautiful picture, and it's a psalm you've heard of. At least you've heard of parts of it. But it begins like this. David says this, his first words. I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will never be shaken. So many enemies are against me. All of them trying to kill me. To them, I'm just a broken down wall or a teetering fence. They plan to topple me from my high position. They delight in telling lies about me. They praise me to my face, but curse me in their hearts. And then he writes this, because you get the feeling you could just keep ranting. But instead he says this, in light of all that, let all that I am wait quietly before the Lord, for my hope is in Him. So here's what I want you to do. Because I believe somebody's going to find freedom and healing and hope and life in this service like many did in the first. I want you to go with me for a minute. I would like you to think of something difficult in your life. Like I'd like you to think of a challenging situation that you're in one that you do not know how to fix. I don't know how to fix my marriage. I don't know how to fix my splintering family. I don't know how to fix the, 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 the sin issue that I can't quit obsessing about. I can't, don't know how to fix my, you know, my parents and the way they're going about it or my school or my identity or my fill in the blank. I want you to think about something you're going through that you don't know how to fix. It might be an addiction. It might be a medical situation. It might be an irrational fear. It might be something very concrete and real. I want you to think of it. Get it in mind. It's the th kind of thing that you have already prayed about. You've asked for advice about. You Googled, which of course is the ultimate, right? You actually Googled, and you still don't know how to fix it. You've done your best, and you've got nothing. No options left. That's right where the scripture is that we're going to study today. That's the story. That's the condition. 
that we're going to look at. Find in your Bibles Mark chapter 5, second book of the New Testament. It is also on your device, but man, the idea of getting fluid and comfortable making your way around a Bible is a good idea. If you need a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. Find in your Bible Mark chapter 5. I'll tell you what's going on as you look it up. I love the book of Mark. Because of the four Gospels, it's the fastest. Here's what I mean. It's miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle. It's almost like nothing else was happening in between. It's like Mark was just like, I'm going to just tell him the, the big stuff. And he just goes from miracle to miracle to miracle. In fact, when we pick it up here in Matthew, I mean in Mark chapter 5, here's what's going down. Jesus is just making laps across the Sea of Galilee. To one side, back, to the other side, back. Why? Because he's, he's trying to get a little bit of space to do some stuff. Yet he can't catch a break. Everywhere he shows up, people are meeting him. So when we pick it up in Mark 5, I'll give you the pre to this. He is trying to get across the Sea of Galilee. Galilee, there's this big storm. They all think they're going to die. He has to quiet the wind and the waves. Then they reach the other side. They encounter a guy who we call the demoniac. He was possessed by more demons than you can count. In fact, they would put chains on him. The town, the village would capture him. They'd put chains on him. He would break them. He's breaking rocks. He's hurting himself. They're all afraid of him. Jesus shows up, casts out the demons. This dude who they're all afraid of begs to come with him and be an apostle. Jesus says, no, nah, I'm awful, I'm good, don't need you, but I need you to go home and just tell everyone about me. So he does. He just, he just starts his trek home telling what Jesus did. He gets back in the boat and says, all right, this isn't working, let's go to the other side. They go to the other side of the lake, it says they land there, and a crowd meets them before he's out of the boat, and a man named Jairus comes up to him. Now Jairus is the, the local administrator of the synagogue. So he's a, he's a known guy, he's not particularly important, but he's important enough. And he has a sick daughter. And it's really one of the most tender translations. He says, my daughter is dying. Will you come heal her? And then he says later, please come heal my little daughter. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus looks at him and says, take me to your house. Let's go. They are on their way to Jairus' house to see this little girl who needs some help. And it says, in beginning at verse 24, Jesus went with him, meaning Jairus, and all the people, they followed. They crowded all around him and followed him. Now, there was a woman in this mob who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she'd gotten worse. 12 years. If you want to put that in perspective, when did this woman start bleeding? 12 years old, maybe? 12 years since, her entire adult life, she's not stopped bleeding. No money, no doctors, no help. And her lifespan, healthy woman of, in the first century, 38, 39 years old. She, she is now in her mid-20s. This seems like a life sentence. She spent it all. The doctors have no idea what to do not been very helpful. You should understand Jewish law, there'd be, and you can read about this in Leviticus 15, 16, 17 through there. When a girl was on her cycle and there were laws and rules for what she would do, they thought that this made her um, in, unclean and impure. She couldn't be around the rest of the group. So during this time, she would kind of be isolated. Then when she was finished, there would be this purification process and she'd be back. Three days, five days, seven days maybe. She, she's been in that process for 12 years. She is unwelcome with the people. She is not allowed to be near people. She is not allowed to congregate. She is not allowed to touch. She is not allowed. She is dirty and unclean. She is an outcast. Sounds harsh. That's the first century. Think about what that means. They had not yet, as far as I'm, I'm not positive, but I don't think Zoom had been invented yet. So she wasn't working at home. She had no way to work because she couldn't be with people. She, she probably didn't have many, if any, friends. Her family wouldn't have been able to be around her. She was an outcast. They treated her a bit like a leper. Like you hear about lepers. and She was treated like a, a leper because she's got this incurable disease, which is unbelievable to bear. She can't even go to church. She's not welcome. Have you ever felt not welcome at church because of something you're going through, something you believe, something you... 
she was not allowed. And people would say, if she began to show up, get away from us. Go away. What are you doing? Do you want to make us all unclean? Get out of here. She'd be actively thrown out of places that she tried early on to show up. I guarantee after a first year or two, you stopped trying. Everyone knew. I suspect she moved around to try and maybe catch a break. She's in rough shape. Picking it back up, it says, this woman had heard about Jesus. I love that. She'd heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him, threw the crowd, and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Okay, now listen, we got to unpack this a little bit because this relates to your day and to your week and to your year more than we know on face value. Understand what happened. This woman, there's something I left out that I just need to tell you. I told you the facts surrounding her illness, the facts surrounding her lifestyle in that culture. Let's get to more of the heart of it. This lady was desperate, full-on desperate. Any way you can think of the word, she is desperate. Understand she can't touch anybody or they're defiled. Nobody can touch her or they're defiled. This woman has never known love. She will never marry. She will never have children, which was the height of disgrace in their challenge. This is a desperate, disgraced, despised woman. All because she has a medical condition. Because she's desperate, she's willing to do things she would never have done otherwise. She was willing to risk it all to deal with what's going on. In her desperation, the only thing she has to cling to is a pinch of faith. You ever been in a spot where you don't really believe because you don't see it, but you've got a pinch of faith? Like a smidge of faith. Like in a dark, like in a dark room when you open up, the, you, you crack a door with it's got light on inside, and just a little bit of light pierces the darkness. She's got a little bit of light. Remember, she's heard something about Jesus. So now she's got this faith. If I can just get to Jesus, he can fix this situation. He can heal me. He can redeem this broken mess. He can rescue my life, which is a waste and a mess and a burden that no one would want. If I could just get to Jesus... In my desperation, he could heal me. Hey, friends, I don't know what's in your mind right now. I don't know what situation you thought of, but here's what I do know. There are some miracles that only occur in the valley where we are discouraged and yet desperate for Jesus. You need to understand that so that you're not caught off guard, so that you're not discouraged, so that you don't just think, hey, I read a miracle and they ought to just happen, right? I ought to just, it ought to just happen, right? Because listen, God said it, so he does it. Sometimes there are miracles that only unfold in our lives when deeper work gets accomplished and we find ourselves in the valley, in the place of discouragement, in the place of desperation for Jesus, where it gets us close enough to Jesus and then the miracle we've been clamoring for occurs. But maybe an even more important miracle happens simultaneously. We'll get to that in just a second. In her valley of valleys, she thinks one thing, if I could just get to Jesus. What do you do when you're in a valley? Right, are you in a valley today? If not, you know they come out of nowhere, right? Like rogue waves. No one saw it coming. The storm may come tomorrow. What, what do you tend to do? What's your MO in a valley? Here's what I find for lots of us. Something comes that's not good. We, we don't want it. This is not from the doctor, from our boss, from a family member, a text, an email. This stinks. So we pray. God, handle this, please. Doesn't get fixed. Doesn't happen. So we pray again. No, God, I come before you. You're the God who can. I ask you to fix this. Will you please will you use your will, use your power, make this better, rescue me. And, and he does it. So the third time, you come to friends. Maybe you bring it to Life Group, or maybe you bring it here to the people who pray with us at the altar. Maybe you bring it to somebody you know and trust spiritually, and you tell them, you say, will you pray for me? Maybe you've got the guts to even say, will you pray with me? And they do. And nothing happens. It seems like nothing is moving, God especially. 
here's what I found. Most of the time, often anyway, we are drawn to embracing doubt, backing off the prayers, because you know I did. God knows I want this. It's, it's on my heart. I prayed. We begin to lose steam and embrace doubt more than faith. Maybe we pray three times, maybe four times, maybe for a month. And then we just sort of drift. We just sort of move on and begin to lose hope. So I need to tell you where I am right now. In this moment, what I want for us, and I've prayed all week, is that if you're there, or if that's been your MO and you will just be back there another day in the future, I want you to hear my voice saying, don't give in to doubt because you're in this low spot in the valley. You're right in the spot where hope takes over. You are right in the spot where hope begins. Nobody needs to claim big hope when something hard happens on Tuesday and they pray on Wednesday God addresses it. We need to pray hope in the hardest places when there's waiting and trusting involved. And I beg you, don't quit, don't stop, don't bail, don't give up on God because He sees you and He loves you. And this is where hope begins, not where hope needs to die. I beg you. In this woman's desperation, she is disgraced. And she becomes our mentor for the day. She becomes our teacher. She becomes the one we learn from. What does she do? She pushes and stretches and reaches out for Jesus. She exercises the only hope that she has. It's the only thing she has left. She could care less who says what. She doesn't care that she's not welcome. She doesn't care who shames her, who yells at her. Heck, she doesn't care how in trouble she gets by being reported, which she was. Certainly would have been reported. This is unacceptable. She doesn't give a flying rip. You know why? Because her eyes are locked on Jesus. Hey, friends, think to the situation I ask you to think about. Are your eyes on the circumstances? Or are your eyes on Jesus? She is simply thinking one thought. It's so singular. It's so helpful. It's so beautiful. She's thinking this. If I could just get to Jesus, I just need to touch his robe, like the hem of his robe. She says the threads. The better translation is, uh, 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 I forgot the better translation. Um, tassel, thank you. Did somebody help me out? Or maybe I just thank you. Maybe I just thank you so much. The tassel. Um, you watch first service. I remember there. Um, the tassel. The idea is every rabbi would have little tassels at the end of the robe. And she's thinking, if I could just get to his tassel, if I could just touch him a little bit, he would make me whole. And with nothing left but hope, she pushes through and experiences her first miracle. Say first miracle. We'll need that. That'll be important later. She experiences her first miracle miracle. Watch this. Verse 29. She pushes through. She touches his robe. And then it says this. Immediately the bleeding stopped. Okay, let's put that in framework for a minute. Immediately after 12 years. Immediately after a lifetime of crying out and being in pain. Immediately after what she's endured that we can't begin to understand. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Something I love that you wouldn't pick up unless you're reading this super carefully. Something that I love about this story is we're hearing it from her. Have you picked up on that? We're hearing it from the woman. Y yeah, John Mark wrote the book. But John Mark's saying things that he could never know unless he got it from her. You saw them in the story, right? It says she'd spent all her money ha, ha, on these doctors. Ha, how did he know that? He didn't follow her life. He had to get that from her. It says, it says that she wasn't getting better. In fact, she was getting worse. That's the kind of thing the patient themselves can tell you. No, I'm, I'm getting worse. It's not getting better. She, she, she has these pieces that we're learning of her private story that I just think are remarkable. She says, it says she thought in her head, if I could just touch Jesus. Well, 
How else would we know that if she wasn't telling us that? And I think I love this one the best. It says, she could tell in her body that the bleeding had stopped. No one knows that but her. You are hearing her story. You're hearing her story. And it's really quite beautiful. She allows her crisis to push her toward Jesus and not away. Did, did y'all get that? I just said that real calm for some people who needed to hear it that way. She allows her crisis, her thing, to push her toward Jesus rather than create distance between her and Jesus. How, how do you do in that spot? Like when things get bad and they don't seem to get better, maybe not for a week or a month or 12 months or 12 years. Does it drive you toward him or does it pull you away from him? What's your story that you would be telling? She is telling a beautiful story of faith where she lets him carry her through the valley of waiting. That's a phrase some of you should write down. The Lord gave me that this morning and I wrote it down realizing that some of you really needed to hear that. She has decided to let God carry her through the valley of waiting. It's part of the process. It's not God being absent. It's not God not caring. It's not nothing being done here. It's an important step, the valley of waiting. And in the valley of waiting that you will experience, as will I, you alone can answer this simple question. So will I trust the Savior that's in my heart or the storm that's in my face? Who's going to direct the condition of your mind and your faith? Is it going to be that you trust the one who gave his life for you and promises like David wrote, you are finding your hope in me and I won't forget you and I won't leave you alone and I've got you. Well, it doesn't feel like it and this storm sucks. So I'm gonna let the storm dictate how I feel about you rather than let me have you tell me how I feel about the storm. That's an important distinction to make. How will you respond? Where will you place your anchor? That's often, I don't have time to dig into this, but this is often influenced by what you've got your eyes focused on. Like right now, the thing you thought of when I said think of the hard situation you're in, is your eyes, are your eyes on Jesus or are your eyes locked on your circumstances? Circumstances always look bad. That's why it's called a problem. That's why it's called difficult. That's why it's called miserable. That's why it's called awful. Because circumstances that we're referring to in this context are meant to be that way. Storms are never like, yay, the big storm is here. Woo, what's going to happen with this tornado? The tornado comes and it's supposed to be horrible, but if you'll lock your eyes on Jesus, there's something bigger that can happen in you. It's happening in her. Have you ever felt like God is a million miles away? Like a million miles away. Like he's not hearing. He doesn't seem to be caring. He's not answering. Are you there? Do you know how much I want this fixed? Do you know how much this hurts? Hello? Are, are you going to answer me? Are you going to Are you going to fix this? Are you going to do something? What if I told you that he is not far away? He is not far away. He sees you. He hears you. He knows. And in the right moment, things can change. There are some of you who aren't believing this at all. Things can change. Things can change. God changes things. Can, can I give you some proof? Okay, go to our woman. That day is a great day. How did she feel that morning when she woke up? That very day, how did she feel when she woke up? Depressed, discouraged, 
desperate. One more day closer to my 13th year of being. I won't be the woman who suffered with bleeding for 12. I'll be 13 if I don't drop dead of hemorrhaging. There we go. Whoa, another day. She woke up that day as discouraged and depressed as ever. And now we're reading about her. And she's having the most historic moment of her life. Whatever you're in today, you have no idea when the valley of waiting comes to the point where God works in your life. It's often tied to what you're letting him do in you while this thing is trying to do something to you. That's important to get through. What is God trying to do in you? I'll tell you what was going on in her. She woke up in the pits and in the middle of the day she was having the most historic moment of her entire life. Twelve years of pain. 12 years of rejection, 12 years of every aspect of her life being affected, and now she is well. Now she is healed. I, I, I told you that Wednesday night we're going to start showing The Chosen from 6 to 8. We're going to have dinner together, and then we're going to watch The Chosen, and that every life group is meeting. You heard Heath, our host, say, Everybody's invited to that. Come on out. You just need to write it on a Connect card or use the QR code to say, I'll be here so we got food and child care for you. All in the house. Those are your ties at work so we can come grow together. But here's what's happening. I want you to get a little taste of the chosen, if you haven't, before this Wednesday. And they do a great job depicting this scene. So I've covered the first five verses, and I'd like you to see the next five with your own eyes. This is the chosen. Let's see what happens after she encounters Jesus. Just a fringe. One touch. Everybody back. I asked the question. Who touched me? Master, the crowds are pressing in all around you like this, and you're asking who touched you? They all have. Someone touched me. I felt that power went out of me. Whoever touched me, come forward, teacher. It was me. Just the fringe of your garment, only the edge, I promise. You are not unclean. Why my garment? I'm sorry. I, I know I shouldn't have asked. 
But if if you touched me, it would make you ritually unclean according to the law. Uh, I was sick. I was sick for his mouth. I bled and, and, and no one could stop it. But, but I believed if I could just touch a piece of your garment. <laughs> and I was right. I was right. Thank you. Who told you I could heal? It was a man from the pool. <laughs> and he was right. The blood has ceased. No one's daughter anymore. Look up. Yes, you are. Daughter. It wasn't my piece of clothing that healed you. But it was instant. I felt it right away. I know. But it wasn't this. It was your faith. Teacher, she was bleeding so low. We can take her. She is clean. <laughs> you have blessed me today. And I know. My daughter, I know it has been a fight for you for so long. You must be exhausted. Go now in peace. Your faith has made you well. I wish I could stay here longer. But I have business to attend to. Someone else has faith like yours. But I'm so glad that we found each other. to see Jesus as he is in scripture and not the weird pictures that have been painted in the past and not some cold, stoic, blonde haired blue-eyed guy with a British accent who never seems to smile. He said, who touched me? Who touched me? He stops the entire crowd. Who touched me? She is elated about her miracle, about her healing, yet instantly she is in her worst nightmare because she is caught. She's healed, yet she is caught. Tw 12 years, 12 years I've been waiting. She says, 12 years, I'm despised and dejected. I'm disgraced and alone and I'm desperate. And I just thought, if, if I could just get to you, if I could just get to you, I knew that you could make me well. I, I didn't care. I didn't care who I defiled in the crowd by touching. I didn't care that I pushed through and that I didn't stay when the rabbi said to come back to me. I didn't care if I defiled you. I was just going to get to you because I, I thought you could make me well. And I was right. That's what she says. I was right. And she was. Let me ask, do you think when Jesus said, who touched me? Do you think he didn't know? Come on now. Do you remember a few weeks ago we looked at Adam and Eve who'd sinned? He says, Adam and Eve, where are you? Huck, I mean, heck, son of a gun, I can't figure out where they are. They're the only two people on the planet. You really think jo Jesus can't find? Listen, God knows where they're hiding. He was giving them a chance to come out of hiding. He knows who touched them. He was giving her a chance to present herself. Listen, you got to get your mind around this because this relates directly to us. There's a great verse, James chapter 4, verse 10. This is one to memorize. It simply says this. It says this, Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will lift you up in honor. 
humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. This woman is caught, but she is not caught for humiliation. She has been caught by grace. She has been caught by the one who's been searching for her, hearing her prayers, caring for her in this valley, and she never knew. And if he loves her like he says he loves her, his heart broke the whole time. But this moment needed to happen in this time because she got something much bigger than anything she planned for. Verse 32 that we saw that you could read later went on to say that even though Jesus knew who touched him, he was looking and the disciples were like, oh, come on. Everyone's touching you. What are you being so high maintenance for? And he's like, never mind. Doing his deal. Who touched me? Verse 33 says that she presents herself to him and falls at his feet, confessing everything everything she's done. And in that moment, she got something much deeper than a physical healing. She received a miracle that was far richer and far more important. Say second miracle. Second miracle. She was healed on the inside. She heard the first loving word that she'd heard in how long? How long? He looks at her and he says, daughter. I'm not a daughter anymore. My father's been done with me for years. My parents have, been, have, have thrown me aside. I don't know love. I don't, I'm nobody's daughter. I'm an orphan. Have you ever felt like an orphan? Have you ever felt like nobody got you? Have you ever felt like you were forgotten, overlooked, despised, didn't matter? find out today that that's not true. He looks at her, and she was surely certain of that, and he says, you are my daughter. From this day forward, you are mine. Why was this so traumatic to her soul? Because, listen, she got unstuck that day, and I feel like this is the spot as we close for some of you. Listen to me. Her issue had become her identity. Now get this, because we mix this one up all the time. Her issue had become her identity. I'm just the bleeding woman. I'm just the outcast. I'm just the woman with this unclean eye. I'm just defiled. How often have you found yourself in the spot where you're just, uh, whatever your label says, l l like I'm just a, a divorcee. I'm just single. I'm just an addict. I'm just a disappointment. I'm just a felon. I'm just somebody who's losing the battle to lust. Fill in the blank with what label you've worn because she's been wearing it for 12 years. And every minute of every day when she's seen somebody in her life affirms the truth of that issue being her identity. And in one second, Jesus shows up on the scene and he erases those penalties. He erases the confusion and he gives her a new identity and he gives her a new name. She is a daughter of the Most High God. That's who she is now. A daughter of the Most High God. If you need to understand how this works for your study group later, take this down. It's on a slide for you. When she touched his robe, lunging out in faith, she was physically healed. When she presented herself and confessed all she'd ever done, she was spiritually healed. She got her body healed, and she got her soul healed. All in that moment. Then he takes her face in his hands, and he says, My daughter, go in peace, for indeed she's in peace. Friends, when you feel helpless... When you feel alone. If you will let your desperation drive you toward him rather than create distance between you and Jesus, he will begin to work in your heart. He will begin to grow your hope he will begin to work in you the way no one else can as he now helps it because you're agreeing to create intimacy instead of distance. 
You'll watch as your hope begins to grow. You'll see as your faith becomes something strong and tangible. Even though your eyes see nothing, the eyes of your faith. What is that about again? Oh, that's right. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we cannot see. And in the dark of the valley, when the storm is the heaviest, and nothing is moving in the right direction in your home, in your heart, in your marriage, in your pain, in your struggle, when nothing seems to be getting better, if you will let that drive you to the feet of Jesus, he will begin to change and do a work in you such that you'll stop waking up asking, so am I better today? And instead you'll be asking, am I closer to him today? And as you grow closer to Christ in time, James 4 takes effect and he will lift you up in honor and you'll receive more than a miracle. A new name. A new identity. Daughter. Son of the Most High God. I remember the day where I became a son of God. I remember what it felt like when Jesus looked at me and said, you are clean. You are mine. And I had surrendered my life to him in that moment. And I meant it in my heart of hearts. And I became a son of God. There's nothing that's affected my hope or set me up to trust him in the valley like that day when he clarified once and for all who I am in Christ. I'm a dearly loved son. And you are too if you know Christ. A dearly loved son or a dearly loved daughter. And if you'll embrace that truth by being driven toward him rather than apart and away from him, you will walk in the truth where you let him carry you in the valley of waiting. I give you these building blocks of hope to take with you. This is what I want you to do so that you can get your mind around and take actual steps in growing your hope in Christ. Number one, read James 4.10. Read it every day. Read it every day this week. Read it every day this week. Be reminded that I need to stay humble and near him. He'll lift me up. Number two, Identify the storm that's making, that you're facing that's making it hard to hope. Name it. What is the storm you're facing? Don't leave it vague. Don't leave it ambiguous. Name the storm you're facing that's making it hard to hope. And then three, pray this prayer. Ask Jesus to help you place your trust in him and to help you push through to get closer to him. You might think I named this talk uh, Faith Leads to Healing or a woman experiences two miracles. Here's what I called it. Pushing through. She pushes through the crowd. And I don't know how I'm telling you this, but as my last sentence, here's what I'm telling you. I don't know what valley you're in, but if you will push through all that wants to keep you from Jesus, if you can get closer to him, if you'll, if you'll lay down before him, he in due time will lift you up. And in the meantime, he will carry you through the valley of waiting. I promise that's his word. This woman, our teacher, says it to be so. Heavenly Father, my prayer is that we will trust you. My prayer is, Lord Jesus, that we would hear you today through the example of this woman. Know that you see us that you hear us, that you care, that you haven't left us to face our perils alone, that we're not destined to live in the valley forever, even if it's been 12 years, even if it's been more pain than we would have ever imagined. We trust you, Lord. We want to trust you more. We want to trust you more than the storm. You say, come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you rest. We need you, Lord. Help us to humbly fall at your feet, and in due time, let you lift us up in honor. In the meantime, carry us through this valley. Help us to trust you. We pray this in your name. We need your touch. Thanks for not giving up on us. Help us to believe that. We pray in your name, Lord. Amen. What a word. Mm. Anyways, blinded. Um, but this next song is Jesus at the Center. And before we sing it, I want us to take like a couple of minutes, or not a minute, maybe about a minute-ish, of silence. Um, 
where everyone in this room is just fixed eyes on Jesus. Let's identify the problem now. Why wait? Let's go ahead and do this action step. I feel like a lot of us know the thing that is hindering our relationship or hindering our eyes being fixed on Jesus. Um, I know for me personally, I'll admit that I have a tendency to focus on the problem rather than to focus on Jesus. And I know the thing that I need to admit to him, as I'm sure many of you do. Um, so whether that's going and kneeling at the cross, whether that's kneeling in your seat, whether it's hands raised before him, let's just take about a minute of just complete silence. Um, just everyone in this room, just fixed eyes on Jesus and let's identify the problem. For some of us, maybe we just don't have hope because we've never allowed him to come in. And if that's you, I'd love to talk to you. I know there's many people in this room that would love to talk to you. Um, but for those of us that have been following, if your eyes are not fixed on Jesus, Jesus, if your eyes are fixed on the thing that is hard, the thing that is causing you to grieve or suffer, um, put your eyes back on him. And for some of us that are vis visual like me, that's I have to look at the cross because I like to see the thing that can heal me. Um, so let's just spend a minute before him and just lay all before him that may be um, hindering our relationship with him whether that be sin, grief, anger, whatever that looks like for you. So let's just take a second in silence to do that. Jesus, we humbly before you just admit that we are faulty. <laughs> Us humans, like we all have something that we struggle with. Um, we struggle to comprehend um, that life can be hard and you can still be good. Because um, that's just our humanness, uh, our tendency to believe that you're not good if things aren't going well. That's not true, though, because you're good all the time and you know what is best for us, regardless of what we think. Help us all to be humbled, to know that you are still good. You're still God over us, and you still see everything that happens in our lives. You know us, you see us, you love us, and you hear our cries. Help us to believe those things rather than just know them. Help us to sink deep into our relationship with you this week and leave the thing that we just laid down behind because that's the only way that we can be healed. Um, in humbly admitting that we are fallen, that we are sinful and that we are not perfect, but you still love us, Jesus. You still choose to love us. And we thank you um, for the work that you did on the cross um, that we're celebrating. We thank you for bearing that for us. Um, and I just ask that you bless our worship as we leave. Um, you know, y'all can stand in worship or you can continue in prayer. Um, however you want to worship is fine. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it'll always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, see nothing else matters. You're the center And everything revolves around you Jesus, you Oh, Jesus, be the center of my life Sing this with me And Jesus, be the center of my life Oh, from beginning it's always been 
This morning, I would like us to sing Hosanna in honor of Palm Sunday. So I can teach it if you don't know it, and then you can just join me, and we can all basically leave singing Hosanna as they did in what we're celebrating today being Palm Sunday. I think it could be really sweet for us to do that. So I want to pray, and then we'll sing like two or three courses of that, and uh, then we'll just leave. So Jesus, thank you for allowing us to gather in here today on Palm Sunday. Um, you are still the same God that died on the cross to save each and every one of us over 2,000 years ago. Um, you still have that healing power. Help us all to believe that you are still that God that can heal us, just as you healed the lady of, with the issue of bleeding. Um, even though we're hopeless, you can give us hope because you are a healer, Jesus. You are a provider. Um, you're anything that we need you to be. So... Um, I just ask that you would meet us and that we would be willing to meet you um, and protect us as we go um, on our way this week. Yeah, in Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. All right, so. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We sing Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Let's do that one more time. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We sing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. 
you, Jesus, for allowing us to gather here today. Bless us on our way out this morning. Um, in your name I pray, amen. See y'all next week. <laughs>